Hi guys, welcome back to the Total Water Polo podcast and this week we are with the Australian international and player of ProRecco, Aaron Younger. He's had an amazing career, um, he's been an integral part of every team he's been in, he pops up, he scores goals, he's great in attack, great in defence, all round top player and we're going to be hearing from him very very shortly just before we start. No need to remind you that you're entitled to 10% off your next order at Wear Water Polo. So using our discount code PODCAST10, just pop that in the checkout and you'll enjoy 10% off your next shop, whether it's t-shirts, trunks, hats, whatever it is, team gear, you can get 10% off and I hope you enjoy that. And if you can, wherever you're accessing this podcast, if you can drop us a like, a review, subscribe, that would help us grow the show and make it better for everyone. But anyway, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you enjoy my chat with Aaron Younger. I'm very excited to welcome Aaron Younger to the Total Water Bella podcast. Aaron, welcome. How are you? Oh, thank you. Yeah, everything's going well here. Just relaxing in Italy now after a tough season and I'm glad to be here yeah thank you very much for joining us and uh it does look absolutely beautiful where you are i'm really very very so um but anyway i i think we've got a lot to talk about um and i think we'll probably start with uh with last week uh the champions league um in belgrade um it seemed like in a pretty amazing tournament um a fantastic finale in front of a packed crowd and obviously congratulations on the win with pro reco um to win on penalties obviously adds a little bit more of excitement, a bit of jeopardy. Um, but how how was it for you guys? Yeah, obviously the the final result was amazing, <laughs> but the road getting there was yeah definitely a tough one. It was amazing to be able to play with supporters again after last year it was a bit of a buzzkill winning the finals there and having no <laughs> absolutely no one in the stadium. So it was uh, really good to play in front of a crowd even if it, the crowd is against you it's always good to at least have some atmosphere and excitement and uh yeah the whole three games was tough for us obviously going against Barcelona in the first game I think they were really unlucky to finish fourth in that group they had a slow start to the season but by the end they were probably even the strongest going into the finals so straight off the bat we were uh, going into a hard game where we needed to win at the end and the only real kind of bit more relaxed game was the semi-final but the whole tournament was a bit of a thrill for us and finally at the end we all managed to get the result we were after but yeah definitely on the edge of our seats for the whole three days. Yeah of course of course and um, it's no secret that the Champions League is a really important um, goal for Pro Reco. Does that does that add a little bit more uh, stress to you guys or or you, you can handle it by now? Oh, yeah, definitely. Obviously, playing here, the expectation is, I mean, like the main goal is always the Champions League. And then there's those side goals of the Italian Championships and Cup. But uh, you always start the season here knowing that your main goal is that Champions League. So when you do finally get there after nine months of playing, that that stress always builds up that you put in all this work for the, for the whole year. And is it going to be enough or are you going to be able to finish at the end? So, yeah, definitely does add a lot of stress, but that's what makes it more enjoyable and more special when it does come at the end. And we'll, we'll talk about um, your club career a little bit more uh, in a minute, but I think um, we'll talk about um, your early years in water polo. Um, you're obviously from Perth, which is way out in the Western Australian. Um, I believe you started water polo when you were 10. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how, how you got into the sport? Yeah, definitely. No, I started when I was around 10 years old, played a bunch of everything, bit of rugby, tennis football wasn't very good at the rest so kind of slowly started narrowing it down as I got older but I don't know kept involved in everything and played down at Melbourne Water Polo Club which is like a well, not a small club it's a big club but a small pool on the river in Perth and kind of just fell in love with the squad They're down there every weekend in the sun playing outdoors similar to Reco it's a nice outdoor pool so it's uh, really enjoyable to spend there especially throughout the summers and slowly kind of made my way through the ranks and started going to state representation teams at 12, 14, and then as I got a bit older, get to the junior national teams, et cetera. And that's when we started traveling over to Europe and that, and then 
that's why I kind of realized the sport's a bit bigger <laughs> in the world than it is in Australia, which was a bit eye-opening for me. And around 17, 18 years old, and finally, yeah, I finally managed to get a contract over in Europe and I moved over to Seged at 17, 18. And that's where it all kind of began to get really serious and joined the men's national team. And from there, I've been traveling and living abroad ever since. You said when you were maybe 12, that's when you started to get involved in the national team. Uh, it, you know, the junior programs and stuff. You said, obviously, that um, the Australians, you, you travelled over to Europe, maybe with the national team. I was I was told a few years ago um, by, by a friend of mine from Australia that those tours are basically for you to to have a fight with, with the Europeans and get used to their level of uh, aggression and physicality. Would you would you agree with that when you uh, when you travelled over to Europe for the first time? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it was a bit eye thing because <laughs> the level of seriousness and... Uh professionality is very different in Australia most people kind of play it as a social sport as you get older there's no like professional pathways so if you're playing like a men's state club league or something you're playing it because you enjoy going down there to play and over here it's more of a lifestyle people are going in there to get professional contracts or to make a living out of the sport so it was definitely a bit eye-opening in the fact that the way the sport was treated and the how the uh, junior athletes and senior athletes were kind of getting so involved in it so it was yeah definitely necessary as a young athlete to go over there and see that <laughs> if we do want to be up in those levels we do need to take the next step in physicality mentality and uh, professionalism you obviously said you you joined Zeged a, a really really well respected club um as a teenager which is obviously you've, you've changed continent you've traveled as halfway around the world um did that scare you at all? Uh, at the time, not really. I mean, as an 18 year old, you got to move out of your parents' home and live in an apartment by yourself. <laughs> your being country didn't seem too bad. I mean, obviously, it was a big change, but it was also exciting as a young young guy to be able to go over there and enjoy life and do something different. So, yeah, a bit of both. <laughs> Definitely different, but it was uh, exciting at the same time. Of course, of course. And, um, you know, you uh you you went to Zeged, but did did you ever consider maybe holding off for a year or two and maybe going to university in America, or were you always really keen to to get in straight away in the professional uh, system in Europe? Uh, probably always preferred Europe. I mean, it was uh, I think the league's obviously a bit stronger over here, and it's a bit more professional. I kind of feel like this. I mean, American system is pretty similar to the Australian, but. I, had to ch I was studying at the time when I moved away, I was doing engineering and then had to change my studies so I could uh, study by correspondence abroad. So I went from engineering into like a commerce or like, like a business degree. So I was studying abroad while I was in Seged. So it did change my educational plans, but <laughs> found a way to keep studying in the end, just in a different pathway. So I could kind of continue developing my career along with uh, my outside of water polo career because unfortunately for water polo it's not a sport you can yeah, retire on for sure that's the that's the way you've got to do it i think um talking of zeged how did how did that come about you were young um were you were you approached by the coach or did you know players there or uh, i knew one player there joe Kays from new zealand who also played for australia i'm sure most people know him he even played for pro record at a stage uh he was playing there but it was kind of uh, Thomas Kashash's dad, Zoltan Kashash, was the coach at the time, and he was involved in like the junior national team with Hungary. So we were always playing against them, and the Australian junior team had actually had a pretty strong team in that that era. So kind of uh, from the junior national circuit, we got found out and just got in contact with them, and slowly started talking over the summer. Obviously, didn't get much money, <laughs> but it was enough to get a start and obviously went over there to improve my water polo. So it was a great opportunity for me. And I was obviously very lucky that they uh, took the jump in the deep end to take a young player from a country not so well known for water polo. But in the end, I think it worked out pretty well for everyone. What was your first impression when you, uh, you know, the first few weeks of, of, of arriving in Hungary and now being a professional water polo player? What... Um, what hit you the most? What was the biggest eye open? Oh, we're definitely on the edge of what's a uh, professional athlete. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if that money uh, makes. Uh, <laughs> we're on the borderline there, but no, no, it was. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was different. Obviously, we'd been to Europe with the junior national team and that kind of stuff before, so we'd seen the 
facilities and played against a few of those players and that before, but to actually get involved in that environment, it was yeah, just a bit of a jump in the deep end. I can't say it was good or bad. It was just really different. I mean, the whole way the club was run, the whole way the training was structured. I mean, we didn't have to wake up at five in the morning to go to training before school or work anymore. <laughs> so you could sleep in and go to training when it was best for your body, not when it was most convenient and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was just a completely different scenario to be in, but it was a, a good experience from day one. And obviously um, you enjoyed some some success, a little bit of success with Zeged. Uh, you were there for a few years and then obviously you went to Yug. Um, and... How amazing was it to play, to play there? Oh, in Sagan, sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, yeah, it was different. I had you know, the three years in Sagan and won a couple of Hungarian Cups. And after three years, I mean, I was there from 18 to 21, had enough. So I'd moved back to Australia just to get a bit more time at home. And then uh, Jug called after that season. So I thought it was a great opportunity to play for a big club like Jug and to get back into Europe at the, the highest level. So that year, I mean, had a year at home and then after that went back to Jürgen. It was, it was yeah, good. Got to play with a bunch of amazing players like Janovic, Boscovic, Bouchier, all these kind of players that were Olympic gold medalists and uh, the top of the sport. So it was yeah, definitely a great opportunity and it was a different experience. And um, and after that, you, I mean, you, you were only there for, for a season. Um, Zolnok came knocking and and this was at a time um maybe some people remember maybe they don't but it just seemed like Zolnok won everything from about like 2015 to like maybe just before 2017 every single game they played it seemed like they 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 won and all the competitions they could win obviously champions of Europe as well and obviously you got to play with some amazing players there as well um how, how good was your time in Zolnok yeah I mean the year out the year I went to Solent, they hadn't won yet. <laughs> they uh, got knocked out in Barca in the, to go into the top four for the Champions League. So they were pushing. and But they, yeah, made a good offer while I was in Jug. And it, they had an amazing team at the time. Obviously, a lot of Olympic champions there. And they were really uh, striving to win the Champions League. That was their main goal. And... Yeah, it was definitely a great setup there. And my wife was Hungarian. Oh, he still is. <laughs> my, yeah. my wife is Hungarian and we thought it's probably probably a good idea to get back somewhere closer to home for her. And uh, yeah, we ended up signing there and then we stayed there three years and it was a good three years. We uh, unfortunately just missed out on the Champions League the first year. We got bronze, but the second year we were able to win it in... Uh, in Budapest, which was a great experience, and Budapest is obviously a place that um, you're you're very popular in. Um, obviously, you moved to Fedem Varos, you know, and you won the Champions League there. It, may, maybe you're the common den- denominator when it comes to winning the the Champions League in Hungary. Maybe that's um, for the for the clubs. But um, you you were there for a few years, and you 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 played some great water polo. There was a great coach, great fans great club culture was it was it actually difficult walking away after you'd won the Champions League or or when Proreco came knocking it was too good of a opportunity not to go oh, I don't know I mean it's hard to pass up on the Italian coastline and yeah obviously we had I mean one in Solnok and then one in Ferenc Varos and then the year after was when I signed to Reco when the, the season unfortunately got cancelled halfway through so who knows what would have happened then but yeah, I think me and my wife felt we'd spent a long time in Hungary at that stage. We'd been in Europe a long time. And Pro Reco, I guess, is kind of the ultimate challenge as a water polo player because they're the team that's usually expected to win. And it's kind of a different feeling when you win something as an underdog or when you go into the final as the uh, strongest contender. I think it's always a bit more challenging to go in as a favourite and uh, do as you're expected to do, go on in under that pressure. And it was kind of the... The last barrier, I mean, not barrier, but the last uh, goal that was really kind of worth achieving in the, the club league just to play for the top club and see what it is like on the other side. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, it was a good offer. It was obviously hard to say goodbye after playing so many years in Hungary and obviously a lot of friends and teammates there, but we thought it was a good time to do it and we haven't regretted it at all. It's been great since we've been here. We're enjoying 
living here and it's been a great team environment and club and setup and everything. So definitely not disappointed in our decision. And, um, you know, we, we, we do have questions in part two that I I think there is there is one that says, I think it's from um, Vince.Tota on Insta. And he, he, he basically asked, how does it feel to be playing in a team that know they are the best in the world? Like, um, it must be a bit of a challenge, but also in a way it must be quite nice that you know that, you know, players around you are, are, are world-class players and there's not many people better as a team. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely a different environment and feeling knowing that uh, no matter what you do for the first nine months, that last three games is going to decide the uh, success of your entire season. So it's a funny way. In the, it's not like the Premier League or something where every point counts throughout the season. We kind of play this nine-month season. And uh, I mean, even this year, we finished the entire season in seven days. We had the... Uh, Italian Championship final on Saturday and then the next Saturday we had the uh, Champions League final so in seven days the success of our entire season was decided so it's definitely a different feeling and a feeling that's hard to get used to but it's uh, under all that pressure and everything that's kind of what makes those successes at the end sweeter. How how hard are you pushing each other you know every meter every scrap every shot are you are you training like mad is that how you guys have, have have become the players you are and playing for the team that you are? Yeah, this year especially. I think probably uh, from my professional career, I think this is probably the most training sessions and training I've ever done during a uh, club season. I mean, we were training even because the Champions League schedule, even pretty much training seven days a week. We would go in a Sunday afternoon just to get ready for the Tuesday, Wednesday games, etc. So, yeah, it was a pretty tough environment. We got... I mean, a roster of 15 players, usually two players rotate out and all 15 of the players are incredibly strong and skillful. So it's a really tough working environment where everyone's just pushing each other and and everyone knows what the goal is at the end. There's no need to even communicate it because everyone knows what they're here for and what they're here to do. So going into the gym every morning and in the pool every day, everyone's kind of got that same common goal and focus, which I think does create a really good environment to... uh, grow as a team and develop and end up to become a stronger group and team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it seems like it's a fantastic environment to be in. And and, and you sort of alluded it to uh, to yourself there, um, you know, playing for Pareco is the pinnacle, really. It's certainly in club water polo. Um, but you, you're now you're now 30, there or thereabouts. Obviously, you've got your family and you, it seems like you're loving life in Italy. You know, you're pro reco next season but what does the future hold beyond then uh yeah i don't know i mean i'm obviously not playing for the national team this year my second my daughter was born my second child was born during the olympics last year which unfortunately i missed out on because i was at the olympics so i realized it was just the time to spend a bit more i mean this summer was a time to spend a bit more time with the family so this summer we're just relaxing and chilling coming back to reco make or start training soon but we're here back at reco next summer here for the next two years at least and after that who knows what uh, (laughs) what spells in the word for us we've studied and everything so we're ready for life after water polo but for now we're just focusing on the kids and the family and growing here and enjoying ourselves and then after these two years we'll see what happens i guess of course of course play play welfare is the most important thing and uh i mean obviously it's 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 a shame maybe you missed the birth of your daughter, but, you know, you've got a good excuse. So, um, you know, it's we you could probably be forgiven for maybe missing that one. But, yeah, of course, take, take the summer yeah, off. A few extra chores at home. Yeah, some people were wondering. I think uh, there were lots of questions about why you weren't involved in the setup. But um, but there, there you are for that. But just, just one thing on that. Um, I noticed a, quite a few, I think it's fair to say, fair few Australians maybe after the Olympics uh, before or you know some of the women also have done it before but um, but quite a few Australians take breaks in this way in ways that you don't necessarily see maybe the players in Europe do that do you think there's anything to that or is that just coincidence or is that not really you know accurate Uh, no no, I think there's a I mean there's a a lot to it. I, none of the players in Australia are getting paid. There's a, 
I mean, like from the national team last year, everyone at Olympics was taking time off work and their full-time jobs to go compete. And it's uh, just a completely different toll mentally and physically. And these players are really sacrificing a lot to be there, whereas the Europeans, they're, I mean, this is their livelihood, this is their living. They go to work every day and that's going to the pool every day to go train. And as an Australian, you go to the pool before work in the morning and then go work all day and then go back to the pool in the afternoon. So it's completely different and obviously the rewards aren't the same for an Australian as a European it's just a completely different trade-off in the entire sport so as an Australian when you reach 30 years old and you realize you've got to start paying your mortgage and <laughs> raising your family the uh, priorities change pretty quickly whereas a European you can kind of keep doing it and keep making money and uh, surviving off the sport so it's a yeah, really different trade-off as an Australian and a European in the sport. Okay, well, I mean, we're, we're now we're now talking about it, and I, I'm pleased we are because it's something I, I've really wanted to talk about, and lots of people have sent questions in on, on this subject. But water polo in Australia, okay, um, I, I think I'm right in saying that the level of participation is is quite high. Actually, um, is, is the sport pretty standardised? Like, I know it might not be the biggest sport, but is it pretty standardised wherever you go? Or the teams, you know, a bit like the in Spain, where they're all concentrated in one area, or or is it spread out across the country? Uh, it's pretty spread out across the country. I think it's kind of dependent on the clubs. Like the club I'm from has thousands and thousands of kids all Saturday, Sunday, even Friday afternoon. Now I think they're doing it. They've got two, three uh, fields set up, and it's just back to back games. And there's it's just insane the amount of kids going there. And there's a lot of clubs like that in Sydney and Melbourne, Queensland too. But the problem is, as they get older, they're retention just doesn't become sustainable because there's no kind of career pathway in the sport or professional pathway so you'll get all these thousands of kids coming down to play from 10 to 16 and then most of them just drop off after that but for participation yeah there's definitely really high numbers in australia it's quite amazing to see it's hard to believe when, <laughs> when you see the sport is professional and you go down to the pool on a saturday morning and there's hundreds of people there down with their kids and everyone's in the pool all day and uh yeah it's it's a weird uh prospect yeah, yeah. and i think um i think the, the australians have been trying to improve their league their domestic league and i think that's something that will always take time um but if you get that right if you make the league more professional i think it does ensure a bit more of a reliable stream of elite players being produced uh you know at home would you agree with that yeah definitely it's uh just the difficulty of setting it up is the main thing and uh, funding and all that kind of stuff. Even if you're playing from Perth to play like the uh, closest game, you're flying four or five hours to get over to Sydney, Melbourne, just to <laughs> play a game. So the prices and expenses are quite high. Obviously in Europe, you just get on a bus and in a few hours you can <laughs> find the next team. And Perth, it's a, I mean, not in Perth in Australia, it's a bit harder to set up a sustainable league just with the travel restrictions and all that kind of stuff. It, does make it quite difficult but with the right people in the right room and the, the right ideas I think they can definitely do amazing things there it's just a difficult thing to get started do you, do you have any do you have any ideas about what would what would be you know feasible to introduce in Australia or or are you uh, are you saying that you, you wouldn't get involved and you'd let someone else think of them no no I'm more, definitely more than happy to get involved but it's kind of what comes first the results or the uh the growth so i think as most countries sports become popular with the results when they see people winning on the international stage and it's hard to get results on the international stage without having those uh competitions and development at the start so it's uh, it's really a hard question to answer there's a lot of people that are trying to work it out and to try and sort out a sustainable like growth pathways for athletes but these things take time it takes at least 10 years to build a high level athlete and the decisions you make now you don't really realize those decisions until a long way into the future so it's a really hard game of uh trial and error and <laughs> unfortunately you don't get much feedback until it's too yeah. late but yeah i think people are trying now and a lot of people are doing great work and they are trying to sort out these pathways there's been a lot of changes in the last few years for better or worse who knows we'll we'll see but people are trying and we'll see i'm always there to help out i've told many people that when I'm around, I'm always happy to give a helping hand. I'd like to see Australia develop into a country that could really actually win something on the international stage. And 
hopefully it does happen. Yeah. Of course. I mean, you, you say that, you say that, and actually you said earlier, you know, results maybe, you know, improves the situation. Um, I think I remember maybe two or three years ago, I tried to look for it, but I couldn't really find it. But uh, basically an article that you wrote in which I'm paraphrasing, um, maybe I'll, I'll look it up and put it in the show notes after on um, in the description. But basically, you, two or three, four years ago, Australia actually actually were doing really well competing with the, t- the top countries that have far superior um, you know, infrastructure in terms of their leagues and clubs and 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 there was still wasn't really the attention uh, being given to you. Um, so I mean, it, it seemed like you were very frustrated about that. Oh, of course, I mean it's always frustrating. I mean for me it's a bit different. I'm over here on a professional contract kind of thing. I'm all set up, but uh, all the guys I was playing with are uh, battling back home, putting in big hours every week to try and play at the highest level and just really not getting the recognition they deserve. So it was a bit disappointing that these guys back in Australia are rolling full-time jobs while training on top of it and then coming over here and doing some amazing stuff. I mean, I was even shocked sometimes after nine months of not seeing them coming back how much they've improved and how much work they've been putting in. And I think they uh, yeah, rarely got the recognition they deserved. And I mean, there was a few times where he could have put off good results. I think we had three world championships in a row where we finished the quarterfinal either with penalties or <laughs> extra time or some weird goal at the end. But, yeah, we're definitely close to breaking that line, unfortunately, didn't. But, yeah, there was a lot of athletes in Australia that really kind of were putting in the uh, effort and yards and didn't really get the recognition they should have been. But, unfortunately, that's the way the, the media works. They, <laughs> they put out what people want to read and water polo is not really in the... Uh, top priorities over there at the moment would uh would you encourage all of your teammates where feasible to come and join you in europe and play professionally uh yeah i don't know it's a bit of a trade-off because often european clubs are pretty stubborn in not taking chances on like kind of unfounded athletes we've been trying to find clubs for a few of the younger athletes now there's going to be quite a few players going to like barcelona barcelona Saturday, these kind of clubs next year but at the same stage, you don't want to send a young athlete to a club that's maybe not so professional when maybe the training environment would be more professional in Australia. And I don't know how you're going to beat the Europeans if you're playing in their lowest level clubs. So, yeah, it's a trade-off between what they can find and what's available for them back at home. But if they can find a contractor, we're definitely trying, and I'm trying as well, to try and find contracts in better clubs, even if it's not for good money, just to get in that environment where they can see how it works over here and play at a higher level. Yeah, and you, you, you mentioned there maybe a few young, younger Australians moving and going to Barcelona or Barcelona and obviously someone who's uh, who's at the top of the club there at the moment is your former coach, Elvis Fatovic, um, a, a legend of the sport really, um, a great player, uh, by all accounts a, a really, really intelligent and, uh, and good coach. Um, what, what was it like being coached by him and... Um, what, what was his style of coaching, for example? I don't know. It was obviously a great experience in that eight years. We had some good results comparative to, I mean, historically. And he was, yeah, definitely a tough coach. Him and Dayan, his assistant coach, were very uh, physically and mentally demanding. But in the end, that's, I mean, what we need because we're coming with a disadvantage location-wise, situation-wise and everything. So you kind of need to put in those extra yards physically and mentally. So they were definitely pushing us. But it was... Uh, I think a great experience for everyone involved together, kind of European style, well, tactically and physically. And it did work out quite well in the end. I think we did get some good results and I think everyone was happy with what happened. But yeah, it was a, it was a good eight years, but definitely tough. <laughs> imagine, I can imagine. Um, but what what's your like lasting impression of, of working with, with Elvis? Uh, it's hard to say one message. I've been more together for eight years and it was... I'm actually nine years because of Corona, (laughs) so uh, two cycles, yeah, so uh, we spent a long time together and obviously from day one to the last day, the kind of structure changed. When he first came, I was still kind of a young, fresh athlete and then by the end, I was captaining the team with him, so our relationship changed a lot over that eight years along with most of the players and I think everyone grew really close over that period and it was uh, obviously hard working, but in the end, we all really liked working with each other and it was a great environment to be in. I can't really think of one exact message. I mean, there's so many 
messages and communications over that period that it's hard to pick out one exactly but that's that's yeah. fair enough <laughs> it's hard to say one thing that's but yeah definitely learned a lot of it. i definitely learned a lot of them over the eight nine year period and i think everyone did in life and water polo. yeah yeah for sure for sure um we're going to talk about um just maybe your international career a little bit and maybe internationals going forward obviously you've you've been at three olympic games one of which when you were you were the youngest i mean uh, no pun intended um but you you were the youngest player in the team you were very very young what what were those experiences like going to the olympics i know you've played numerous world championships and things like this as well but obviously the olympic games is is the biggest yeah it was definitely a different experience i think you can't experience in normal day life ever but uh obviously the first one in london was a bit eye-opening for me just the whole gravity of the size of the event and everything it's just uh eye-opening how <laughs> how many people are involved and how big the competition is in itself and walking into the first game obviously full stadium in a foreign country being one of the youngest guys was just an incredible feeling knowing all, you had all that support and getting all those messages from back home and it's just yeah a completely different experience which you can't really experience even at world championships that kind of stuff it's just it's just bigger it's just on a bigger scale but at the end of the day the sport didn't change just the, <laughs> just the size and uh involvement did so it's a it's a weird thing so sometimes sometimes when especially in water polo where the olympics is such a um, prestigious event we, we kind of talk about it like it's a completely different sport like it's a different like a uh, variation of a sport but it's still it's still the same thing but did you notice any did you notice an increase in quality at the olympics because there, there is an argument to be made that actually the teams that actually go to the olympics aren't always at the time you know the, the best 16 or best 12 teams actually in the world but did you notice that the players there and the teams there the standard is a bit higher uh, i think the standard's higher just because of how much people put into it i mean everyone's got that four-year cycle in mind with the pinnacle being the olympics every time so all your work is always focused on the end of that four years to be ready for that two weeks and unfortunately it only comes every four years so the the pressure over that time for that two weeks really builds up and the uh, emphasis on getting the results in that period so the mental and physical side everyone's really peaking during that week so just naturally I think it's a high level just because of the importance everyone puts into it and the amount of focus and work everyone kind of puts in to be ready just for that two weeks so it's hard to find another tournament where there's that much preparation and uh, mental willingness to, yeah, to work yeah, for sure for sure and, and that kind of leads me on to my to my next sort of topic of conversation which is obviously the next olympic games now um you've achieved nearly everything you can achieve with your club with your national team um there's i there i think it's fair to say there's only so far uh you can get and the reason i do ask this is because there have been several reports and rumors that maybe you've considered uh, changing nationality uh, representation is there anything you can you can share with us on this for, for going forward for Paris oh uh, yeah obviously I mean most people know I do have a Hungarian passport as well so it's kind of old news in a way yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh no there's nothing to really there's nothing to really report on at the moment after this season I was absolutely crushed I mean we, the finals just absolutely took it out of us. So for this summer, definitely just chilling and relaxing. I have spoken with the Hungarians before, I mean, they called me before as well on whether I was interested to play in the national team and that kind of stuff. But no, there's no agreements or plans or anything. So for the moment, just resting. And then, I don't know, we'll see next year what happens. We'll, we go play in Malta in the, so, well, not social leagues, in the leagues over there or go back to the national team or go to Hungary. I don't know, it's still... Yeah, there's no plans as of yet, just to relax and get away from water polo for a bit for the moment. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, no plans, but uh, you would consider playing for another nation? Uh, yeah, not sure. I mean, obviously a discussion that would need to be had and a decision that would be a very serious one after being with the Australian team so long. So definitely not something I would take lightly, but I don't know. If the day does come to discuss it, I would, of course, uh, go into it with an open mind, but... 
yeah, I don't know the, for the moment, to be honest. So I would have to have to put a bit of thought into it. <laughs> it's been a long people, time. People uh, do get quite defensive um, about about talking about things like this, and I understand there's a lot of emotion, and you've probably had some amazing memories with uh, the Australian national team. Uh, you certainly wouldn't be the first uh, player to change nationalities. I mean, we have we see in water polo, it's, it's very common. Um, and some people have even changed several times. And you certainly a lot of the Russians at the moment, you're seeing, seeing them. Yeah, yeah which they're not allowed to play. Um, <laughs> maybe it's something uh, to look into uh, for a rule change, but... No, uh, I, I thought I thought I'd be cheeky and, and ask you the question, and you've been you've been honest. So. No, no, I've been I've been I've been asked many times, but I think uh, once I said I was having a, a year off, I think the rumors started flying a bit. But no, there's definitely no agreements or anything. Okay, so. okay. <laughs> I do have a dual citizenship. That's true, but uh, no, there's no agreements or plans or anything. So for now, resting, relaxing, and if. I mean, logistically, I do have the possibility, but yeah, no, nothing planned yet. Well, we'll uh, we'll we'll leave that as a uh, as nothing nothing's planned at the moment, and I'm sure someone else will ask you in the future, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll see then. Uh, um, no, 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 I, uh, <laughs> many yeah, have yeah, already. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll we'll probably take a break now. Um, I'll let you know if uh, something course, comes on. Of course, you, you've got my number. You've got my number. <laughs> Um, we'll, we'll take a break now um, and we'll come back in part two with um, some questions that people have sent in via social media. Too easy. Sounds good. Welcome back to this episode of the Total Water Polo podcast. I'm sitting with Aaron Younger and Aaron, this is the part uh, where we ask questions that people have sent in via social media. The first question we always ask our guests is for them to give their total seven, so their all-time favourite seven, best players they've played with, against, or players they've never played with, um, or even just their friends, wh- whoever they feel like. So um, if, if you don't mind giving us the name of seven players, their positions, and uh, yeah, take it away. Oh, I, might have to... <laughs> I might have to have a big quick thing about it. Been thrown under the bus here. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think I sent one in. I should have given. Yeah, I think I told you. Before. <laughs> yeah. you could have jo- jo- I think I sent one in post Olympics, didn't I? Oh, got to got to go back to what I put there. Um, I might have to come back to this. I have to have a yeah, little thing while we're that's talking. Ancient history. Ancient history. Yeah, we had a whole season since then. Oh, really? <laughs> really? Okay. I hope. Yeah, yeah. I hope that's not your way of trying to wriggle out of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I just have to. Th- I just have to throw the record starting seven in there and change me. <laughs> Keeping everyone's good books. No, no, we'll see. I'll have a thing. I'll have a thing. You come back to it. Right, so this one. Um, the next one uh, is a similar similar sort of uh, question. It's Lou underscore KRST on Instagram. And who is the best player you've ever played with and why? It's kind of hard to pick one good player. I mean, played with several Olympic champions, that kind of thing. And I think it would kind of be rude to pick one. I mean, obviously, it was playing with Polanovic, Denis Varga, Leke Vivicia, Moundic, Zelanki, all these kind of guys. So to say one kind of stands out about the IRS is, uh, would kind of be even incorrect to say, I think, obviously, on their day, each player has played better than the other and sometimes worse than the other. And lots of them have played long <laughs> careers where they've just been able to win everything and go for 15, 16 years at the top of their game. But, yeah, obviously, some of the easy ones to mention, you got Polanovic, Dennis Varga. Even, you see, Zelanki now is becoming an amazing player. you got Lech Ivovic here, the captain, who's just had an amazingly long and prosperous career. And, yeah, there's just uh, too many legends to kind of pick out one, to be honest, and they've all got their facets of the game where they've just been absolute leaders. So to pick one, I'd say it would be incorrect. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um yeah, most even with the total seven thing. When I ask for seven players, normally I get given no, like course, fifteen. It's, it's so horrible. it's it's fair enough. It's, it's especially on any given day, one of them could beat the other, and uh, vice versa. And it's <laughs> year by year. Obviously, some win, some don't. And yeah, but I think there's been a bunch of players that I've played with that have been able to maintain that level for so many years, which is just an incredible thing. Sure. Um, 
manilo.psc on Instagram asks, in your opinion, is the Italian league the best league in Europe? Uh, I wouldn't know if it would historically be the best, but I think this year obviously you saw Reco was the top of our group and Bresh was the top of their group and we had a couple of strong teams in the uh, Euro Cup and that kind of thing. So on results itself, it would uh, signify that Italy is probably the strongest league or was the strongest league this year. But yeah, it changes year to year as clubs find funny, etc. But as you can see now, I think, yeah, there's a lot of clubs in Italy that are really pushing and the uh, level has really improved here in the last couple of years. So it's probably the toughest or if not one of the toughest leagues in the world for sure. Have you ever have you ever had conversations with some of your current teammates or ex-teammates? Is there like a consensus amongst players which league is the best or do you think it varies so much year on year with the change of players and clubs and finances? The yeah, way clubs I think it changes are, a lot. You know, gain like sponsorship and stuff it can change yeah no i think it changes a lot year to year like even if you look three four years ago the hungarian league i think was the strongest by far when you had a really strong soul off you had ferenc virus that was push, pushing you had osc was with the foreigners as well which is much stronger than they are now obviously that's changed a lot now i mean now it's had just the one club kind of competitive in europe and now there's that funding's kind of switched towards uh, Italy, even Serbia has got so much stronger now. If you looked at the Serbian league a few years ago, they didn't really have anything going for them in the uh, European leagues. All their top players were abroad and this last season and even next season, you can see they're starting to push a lot more. So it really does vary year to year. Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree with that. Um, Michael underscore Sharrett asks, when and what was the most intensive chapter of your career? I don't know if you ever, you know, chapter your 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 career but like is in if is there a period of time where you you consider that to be the hardest the the most intensive or or something like this uh i mean it depends on what way you measure intensity <laughs> uh obviously like through some of those national team olympic cycles and that kind of stuff going off uh the long club season then getting to the national team and just pushing as hard as you can for two months has probably been some of the physical most physical and mental periods of my life. Obviously, Tokyo, I kind of knew before Tokyo that that was a good chance. Maybe my last Olympics where my wife was pregnant, had just come off a really long season with Reco. We just won the Champions League, that kind of stuff. So that was definitely a very tough summer. And it, that was, yeah, I mean, <laughs> my dog passed away two days before our first game in Tokyo as well. So that was a physically and very tough, physically and mentally very tough summer. But even now, this last this last seven eight days with a uh, reco. I mean, we had the finish of the championship and the uh, Champions League finals within seven days. So stress and <laughs> pressure wise, that was up there as well. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I can imagine emotionally uh, difficult as as well as um, as well as physical. Um, okay, well we've got we've got quite a few questions here. Um, there's like. There's four or five very similar ones. Um, K. Pouliasis asks, I have a hard time focusing on games. Do you have any advice? Yosef Molina asks, how do you, you manage to perform under pressure? Some are asking, what what advice would you give to train? Um, Savara Radic asks, how um, are you able to stay so calm in tough situations? Um, do you ever... Do you ever, I mean, have you ever thought about if someone were to ask you to, for advice, what would you share with them based on your experiences, you know, playing international, playing in, in Europe, about how to train, how to stay focused, um, how to perform under pressure? What advice would you give them? Yeah, I think it's always tough. And I think a thing that people don't realise is is that uh, the pressure and anxiety and that stuff's always there. It's always just about managing it. There's nobody going into a final or whatever that's gone chilled out <laughs> cool as a cucumber kind of thing it's uh it yeah, i mean yeah. that anxiety and that stress for the games never goes away it almost gets higher the higher level you get because the, the anticipation or the expectations to win is always there but i think it's just about finding a way to manage it and realizing the reality of what your situation is and just preparing and knowing that you're not going there to win the game you're going there to do that first defense which you've practiced a thousand times that first attack the first pass the first shot so you kind of just got to focus on the the procedures and the uh what you're doing and not the end result and 
in the end, if you just focus on that play by play kind of mentality where you just need to do what you're doing now and then you move on to the next thing and not trying to get overwhelmed with what the end result's going to be. Obviously, that even goes into warm up, like preparing for a game. I've kind of got a standard routine. It's not generally for stress, it's because we play 100 games a year. So it's good to just switch off in the warm up and go into your routine because you don't need to think, oh, what I need to do now. You know what yeah. your body needs. And when you're warming up, that's what you're focusing on, getting your body warm. You're not thinking about the last play of the game kind of thing or what that last shot could be. You're just focusing on what you need to do for that moment and then move from moment to moment. And if you've uh, put in the right training and you've done the right work in the end, all that stuff comes together and those moments all add up and hopefully lead to the result at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, have you ever thought about coaching maybe after your, have you, have you ever done any coaching badges or anything uh, like that? Maybe when you're retired, would you done a bit of coaching of young kids just for fun, but uh, definitely not really my plans to be honest. I'd like to help out in Australia where I can just to try and help things improve there and hopefully try and put in some pathways for uh, the next generation to develop. But, to be honest, it's not really in my plans after water polo. I kind of feel like I'd like a bit of a scenery change to get into the professional working space a bit in something else and, yeah, maybe leave this part of my life behind me and leave it as a good memory. But, yeah, obviously always happy to help out where I can, but I don't think I'd be looking for to do it as a profession. Yeah, just, just because um, just because I had a question here from um, Rick the Best 91 who's said, what will you do for a living when you're done playing water polo? And obviously you, you don't know uh, necessarily what, uh, what exactly you might be doing, but obviously you, you do have, you do have two, two degrees. Am I right in saying that? Um, one from the university of New South Wales and one from Curtin. Like, so you're, you've, you're, you're well qualified, um, to go and, to go and, and, and find something. Would you know what it would uh, be? Yeah. yeah I mean, I was, because I was uh, talking with some people after Ferenc Warish, we were kind of planning to go back to Australia then. But in the end, record called and it was too good of an opportunity to pass up. But yeah, probably looking somewhere in the finance kind of space. So we'll see. But yeah, my education is kind of built around that. So hopefully there's some doors still open <laughs> when I do finally retire. But that's the uh, relative plan. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, of course, of course. And... Um... I mean, I, I guess lastly, um, how do you spend your free time? You know, I, I know now you've got a, a very young family and um, I hope everything's well there. And obviously you're in Italy and um, and you're you're planning to spend some time off this summer. What what exactly will you be getting up to and what sort of things do you do? What hobbies do you have? Uh, uh, I think my hobbies went out the door with two kids. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, since we finished the league, We've just been pretty much going down to the beach every day, letting the kids swim. We've got a dog now as well, so letting them swim and play around, being out on these paddle boards a bit and stuff like that. But to be honest, nothing uh, sporty or specific, just uh, getting out, getting outside and enjoying life, playing with the kids. And he started to get into a few sports now, so kicking the ball around and that kind of stuff. But yeah, just... Just enjoyable summer programs, nothing too specific, no kite flying or model aeroplane making or anything. No, no, <laughs> no that's, that's fair enough, that's fair enough. Um, Aaron, they're, they're, they're the questions we've got. Thank you very much for, for answering them and I, uh, I honestly hope um, you, you enjoy your, your time off and spend some time with your family. And, uh, but of course, we hope everyone hopes to, uh, to see you back in, in the pool soon. Thank you very much for having me and I'll uh, be in touch with you guys soon. That was uh, that was great fun. That was Aaron Younger. Um, I'm really pleased that he um, he's taken the decision to take the summer off. Obviously, we'd all love to see him in the pool, but you know he's got a young family now, two young kids. He's been training like a like a dog for the last two years, so I think he definitely deserves a break. But obviously, we want to see him back in the pool very soon. But that was the chat with him, and uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget your discount code, podcast10 at werewalterpolo.com. And if you can give us a like or subscribe, or if you want to message us about anything, feel free to do so via our social media channel. Have a great week, guys, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>